This is Mark Tobias in Reykjavik, Iceland at the Meteorological Center uh, where they're monitoring her, uh, the earthquakes, the volcanoes, uh, what's going on in Iceland. And we're with uh, Sarah Borsati. Yep. And you're the director of Volcano Hazard? Well, yes, the coordinator for Volcano The coordinator, hazards. okay. Yes. So, first of all, what do you yeah. do? Yes, okay, what we are doing, I mean, we are monitoring volcanoes, their seismic activity, mostly, and we are trying to figure out, figure out what a volcano could do in terms of which hazards it could uh, pose, you know, to the, to, the, to the land here on a local scale as well as on a, on a wider scale, on a global scale. And this is your monitoring center for the country? Yes, yeah, so here this is the, the, the desk for the, for the person on duty, the geophysicist on duty, that is mostly following the, the seismic activity within all the, within all the, uh, within all the country. So from here you can just follow all the signals coming from the seismic station, as well as the information from the, from the infrasound, tremor plots, and maps showing the location of the of the latest earthquake and webcams for seeing the ongoing event just because now we are having an eruption and yes and from here the, the person on duty could just check the events and defining the depth of the earthquake as well as the the magnitude so the first of all everything's coordinated in Iceland it's not a big country you only have 325,000 people mm -hmm. um, what is of interest is all of your every all the information is combined in this center for weather, volcano. Yes, exactly. I mean, the Icelandic Meteorological Office is both a meteorological office as well as a volcano observatory, and IMO is in charge for um, monitoring uh, natural phenomena, natural processes, as well as issuing warnings to the public in case of any natural hazards that are any kind of natural hazards that could be uh, volcanoes, could be floods, could be earthquakes, could be weather, as well as avalanches or landslides. And you closely coordinate uh, with uh, Oscar Paulson and his group over at uh, air traffic control for the North Atlantic region yes. as well as Iceland yes. so everything is coordinated yeah and everything all of your seismic sensors you have uh, approximately 30 volcanoes in Iceland yes yes around 32 volcanic systems volcanic system yep. yeah okay <laughs> and all of those there's sensors all over the country that are linked by radio yep. for GPS to determine glacier movement Yes, I mean, all over the countries we have something like uh, 70 seismic sensors, se seismic stations, and roughly the same number of GPS displays located, deployed on all over the country, even though they are quite well localized along the, the western, the eastern and northern volcanic zone, and to the southern and northern seismic zones, just to be. And GPS, people might wonder, why do you have GPS? And the, the answer is so you can detect down to one millimeter the movement of yeah. glaciers? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And why is the movement of glaciers relevant? Why is it important? <laughs> um, okay, you know, I mean, in terms of um, balances of uh, I mean, budget in terms of ice, um, weight, and the water that could be just, you know, melted by the, by the glaciers, you know. There are uh, several big glaciers in Iceland and probably this budget should be monitored mostly for, you know, um, glacial studies and climate effect. But, but it also has relevance to flooding, is that correct? No, definitely, I don't know, definitely, uh, you know, most of the most of the volcanoes in Iceland they are just located beneath glacier, and this implies that a potential eruption in Iceland has as a major um, 
outcomes or hazards related with an eruption, just an inundation, what is called the yokule here, that is, you know, this glacial outburst of water that could be accumulated beneath the glacier, and then, you know, when the pressure will, will be large enough to, to make the water just to, to be free, to, to run towards the, um, the lower uh, altitudes. I mean, it will just invade all the area, you know, downstream. Yes, after, after the, the magna, the lava melts the glacier above it. Yes, this is the point. I mean, what we could expect for a superglacial eruption is that the magma, as soon as it will be able to, to break through the, the crust, it will arrive at the bottom of the glacier and there to start to melt the ice where then the water that will be produced by this process would just accumulate there and then start to, to flow away from there and just to, you know, invade the area downstream. So in 2010, Iceland had the distinction of interrupting air traffic mm -hmm. for North, North America, Europe for about 10 days yes. because of your last major volcanic eruption. Yeah. So what's different in the latest volcanic eruption that started on August 16th of this year and that one? Yeah, well, let's say that uh, there are some differences in terms of geological settings of the volcanoes. I mean, uh, the Bardarbunga volcanic system is a huge volcanic system. It is really crossing all the northwestern part of Vatnajökull. So it is really extending from southern part of Vatnajökull towards the northern part in the in the ice-free area of Vatnajökull. And this means that we could expect a quite wide range of eruptions from Bardarbunga. And and what we are seeing now, indeed, you know, after we saw this, this magma movement within the crust um, outside the, the, the area covered by the ice, uh, now we are seeing mostly uh, an effusive eruption in the ice-free part of the system. And so at the moment, the activity is a pure effusive eruption with a huge release of gases and aerosols, but let's say at the moment very low concerns for the aviation is just, you know, um, what we are seeing. Um, while during the AF at the eruption, I mean, the eruption that occurred there was a subglacial eruption that had to melt something like between 50 to 200 meters of uh, ice, you know, this was the thickness of the ice in the um, in AF at the and so this interaction with the, with the ice, with the melted water, then made this strong uh, explosive eruption at that time. Even though, you know, in terms of uh, magnitude and height of the column, we really didn't see nothing special. Special was the impact downwind, mostly due to this sustained northwesterly wind that made all the ash to be blown towards Europe and the main airport right. there. Um, here, still the scenarios that are still open are even the, the likelihood that, that this fracture could still move towards the glacier, so we cannot exclude that this fracture will, will open uh, beneath the ice, and in that case we could still expect some magma water interaction that could, could still produce some, some ash. It is not occurred until now, but we cannot exclude that, that this will happen in the future. And the main point is that indeed within the, the main part of the volcano where the caldera is, there the thickness of the ice is very, very thick. I mean, it is up to 800 meters. In that case, the effect of the ice with the, with the, on, the, on the eruption itself could be just the opposite. You know, due to the load of all this amount of ice, the explosivity could be really, really reduced. So okay. we could even expect that for a lot of ice above the, the eruptive side, this could just, you know, the, the, the big pressure that all these ice could just um, impress on the, on the magma, this could only be a subglacial eruption with no subaerial component. So do, do the air travelers, in the United States especially, at this point need to be concerned about what's going on up here, given the fact that there's, I understand, a thousand, fifteen hundred earthquakes a day that are going on as a result of this latest volcanic eruption. Yes, yes. I mean, currently the seismicity is definitely 
much more lower than it was uh, days ago. Uh, but what we are doing, I mean, you know, the aviation color code is still orange for barter bonga. Which is the second highest. Yes, yes, definitely. And in this specific case, it is what is telling to the aviation community is that an eruption is ongoing, but as it is now, it is of no concerns for the aviation. But one of the scenarios that we are still keeping open is that this fracture could still move, you know, to be propagated beneath the glacier, and in that case, the most likely scenario will be an explosive eruption, a phreatomagmatic explosive eruption. And would that affect aviation? Most likely, yes. To, to, and to what, it, to, in a comparison with what happened four years ago, to what extent? Not as much equivalent, well, okay, or can you say, really okay, say? I mean, let's say that Barta Bunga in, in the last 1,000 years had something like 22 um, eruption in the area, in the ice-covered part of the of the system, and in all these cases, the intensity of the eruption has been within two and four VEI, which is the the volcanic explosive index. This means that we could expect from this volcano, a column height up to 15 kilometer. 15 kilometer, which, which would impact aviation. Definitely. So what, do you think this is a real possibility or not? I think that we are, I mean, I think what we are saying, we are still considering this, this, uh, this one of the potential scenario that we should face in the next days or weeks. In the next days or weeks. Yeah. And is, is aviation currently impacted across Iceland? Are planes not flying in this zone? No, no. Being in this orange status, the IMO as a meteorological office is not issuing any SIGMAT that are this official communication to the aviation for some uh, presents in air of volcanic clouds, so we are not issuing nothing. What we are seeing is a white um, steam cloud produced by the current uh, eruption that by now has been considered of no danger for the aviation. Okay, so, so people shouldn't change their plans. No, not really. Not yet. But, but they should know that an eruption is ongoing. Okay, so here's... Uh, a lot of readers probably do not understand what a volcano is. Mm -hmm. They see it on television, they know it's dangerous, they know it can have these kind of impacts, but a very simple definition, if that's possible. Yeah. What exactly is a volcano? <laughs> In a very simple way, what is exactly a volcano? <laughs> yes, yeah, I see your colleagues yeah, are yeah, signaling yeah, you. Yeah, yes, yeah, why don't you explain well, it? Well, you know, in a very simple way, you know, it could be assumed to be <laughs> uh, a direct channel, you know, from what, what is the, the material that is within the mantle, so, you know, beneath, beneath the crust, which is the most solid part of our, of, of, the, of the earth itself, so it could be an opening view on what is just within, you know, close to the core of the earth, and so we, we, we see what, what is um, really uh, making the, our heart to be an, an Alive, alive, you know, uh, body, and so from this, um, the magma that could find, you know, um, a view from, from escaping from the, from from beneath the crust, it will be addressed mostly by, you know, gases that within uh, the crust finding it at different pressure could make could start to to the gas. And, and the mixture made of, you know, melted uh, uh, crystals or material would start to accelerate due to this degassing and expansion of the, of, of, of the volcanic gases within, within the mixture. And, and, and what we see at the beginning is that when this process could be started, the magma started to rising up, will start to fracture the crust that will be quite hard, you know, during this, these first movements. And this is what we saw here very, very clearly, this dike that was moving, propagating, and breaking the crust, the, the hardest part of the crust, creating stroke signals in the seismicity. And then as soon as the, the crust has been weakened, weakened enough, this magma found a way for rising up and showing us, you know, part of, of, of you know, its 
it's blood, you know, blood of the earth. <laughs> and so magna is is uh, the the term for molten rock, as I yeah. understand it, molten lava. Yeah. So we have extreme temperatures oh, that are that are melting yeah. rock yes, that are creating this whole, whole mass. Yes. 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 And has anybody been put at risk in Iceland as a result of this latest eruption? Sorry? Has any, has, have any of your residents, citizens, been put at risk or is this so remote that it hasn't been a problem yet? Let's say at the moment, for how is the eruption ongoing now, there are some people working in the fields. So we have right. teams of scientists that are working close to the eruption site. And I think they, at the moment, they are the most exposed people. Yes, you've moved all your hikers, campers, everybody's been told to stay away. Yeah, yeah definitely. No, the area is closed. This has been closed yeah. by the civil protection since uh, at least two weeks, I think, when still we were thinking that, that the most likely scenario could have been a subglacial eruption, and so the flood could have been really invaded all the northern part of the of the Vatran Yukut area, reaching, reaching, you know, the sea, almost. When the eruption started, we are seeing this effusive eruption. Still, you know, what we cannot exclude is that the lava flow could meet some groundwater, create explosion. So what is called the rootless cones, so that still there could be some ejection of magma in the air that yeah. could reach, you know, even high altitudes. So, and still we are <coughs> seeing even some degassing. So all the volcanic ashes in a, such a huge concentration could be very dangerous for, for health purposes. And when a when a volcano throws out magna up into the air, what kind of size pieces are we talking about? We're not talking about little rocks, are we? Well, by now what we are seeing are a lot of fountaining, so these are more spatters or material, you know, that then cooling, they create these these pieces of, you know, what we could, we, yeah, what we could call, you know, small bombs. Right. Yeah. But I've seen some fairly large pieces yeah. of yeah. lava yeah. Yeah. that are not, you wouldn't want to be hit by one. No, uh, no definitely. definitely. No, this is the reason for which I'm saying that who is exposed now are the people in the field at the moment. But they are not really staying close to the fissure itself. Right. I mean, in case we are just moving in the front part of the lava field. And or just upwind the upwind the, the eruptive fissure. So the bottom line here, in conclusion, right now, travelers in America and Europe they shouldn't be worried about what's happening here. They should just be paying attention to know that definitely. something could yes. really be a problem. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, what IMO is doing is is just keeping everybody informed almost in real time. We are issuing communication daily to a quite wide international community. And so I think the suggestion is should be just to follow the situation as it is, and we are really, 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 um, any time any change is occurring, update the situation and, you know, making plans right. as, a, as a consequence. Yeah, I'll put your link to your website, yes. which has all the latest data. Yes. Sarah, yeah. is there anything I've missed that everybody <laughs> ought to know? <laughs> No, I think, you know, just, just look at the, at the webcams until now, the eruption is a nice eruption. Um, an interesting eruption. An interesting eruption. And <laughs> again, we are still really open to a lot of other scenarios that could even be, you know, such a, still a, a big explosive eruption, but maybe not. So what we can do is just continue to monitor the, the country, monitor the volcano, monitoring from both seismic, infrasound, the GPS, all kind of sensor that we could have, you know, for to be used and deployed for this kind of monitoring. Right. Sarah, thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate your time today. <laughs>